Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. All right, um, I'm going to get started um, as everybody's filing in. Um, we'd love to see where you guys are from. Uh, and so go ahead and put that in the chat box. But hello and welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Haley Butler, the Communications Coordinator for the International Quilt Museum. While we gather, I'd like to share some information about Textile Talks. Textile Talks features weekly presentations and panel discussions from the International Quilt Museum, Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. The programs are held online at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Wednesdays. And today we will present the International Quilt Museum at 25 New Horizons. Next week, the Virginia Quilt Museum in Sakwa will present Inspired by Endangered Species presented at the Virginia Quilt Museum. As, a today of today, as an attendee of today's textile talk, you will receive an email with a link to register for that program. Thank you to our sponsors who make it possible to provide these textile talks for free. Thank you to Moda Fabrics, Orophil, CNT Publishing, eQuilter, Handy Quilter, Attached Ink slash Misty Fuse, Artistic Artifacts, Nine Patch Fabrics, Sh Shipper Publishing, and TheQuiltShow.com. And thank you to viewers like you who are supporting Textile Talks with individual donations. If you enjoy Textile Talks, consider making a donation today. Lucy has placed a link in the chat if you'd like to help us donate and help outset the cost of this production. Um, now I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Maren Hansen. Maren Hansen is the International Quilt Museum's Curator of International Collections and is responsible for building and interpreting the museum's non-Western collection. She earned her Master's of Arts in Museum Studies and Textile History from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and her PhD in Museum Studies from the University of Leicester in the UK. Hansen has curated a variety of exhibitions at the International Quilt Museum and is the co-editor of the book, American Quilts in the Modern Age, 1870 to 1940. Editor of the book, Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50, and the project curator for the uh, International Quilt Museum's World Quilt website. She's been a curator here at the International Quilt Museum since 2001. If any of you guys have any questions during today's pro program, please type them into the Q&A function. And when there's time at the end, I'll do my best to ask Maren as many questions from you guys as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, and just note that if you type in questions about specific quilts that Maren's going to be showing us, um, you know, I won't be able to necessarily get to them exactly at the time that they're shown, but just think of some overall questions at the end you'd like to present. Those always do the best. And with that, uh, let's welcome Maren Hansen. Hi, and thank you so much for that wonderful welcome and introduction, Haley. I am pleased to be here again. I love being able to participate in textile talks. I think it's it's turned out to be such a fantastic program. Uh, you know, it came out of COVID and uh, out of the pandemic. It's one of the silver linings, I guess we could say. It's just been so much fun to be able to be part of these. And today I am going to be talking about one of our current exhibitions, New Horizons. It is part of an exhibition series and it, the series is the overarching title for the exhibition series is an evolving vision, the James collection 1997 to, to 2022. Um, and as I, uh, as I stated a few weeks ago, when I appeared with Carolyn Ducey, my co curator at the International Quilt Museum, one of the reasons that we are curating this exhibition series is to celebrate the International Quilt Museum's 25th birthday or anniversary. It is also the 25th anniversary of the arrival of the artists and Robert James collection at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. So that was uh, the moment that our institution was founded 
Uh, we were called the International Quilt Study Center back then, back in 1997, but today we are the International Quilt Museum and we are thrilled to be celebrating 25 years with all of you. And as I mentioned, Carolyn and I talked about this exhibition series back on March 9th. If you didn't get to tune into it back then, uh, you can find a recording of it on uh, the International Quilt Museum YouTube channel, as well as the channel of all of our uh, partnering organizations. And we talked about uh, the exhibition that we call Classics. Uh, that's one of the three. We talked about classics, uh, quilts including uh, the Reconciliation Quilt, My Crazy Dream, um, Grandma Carpenter's Quilt. So hopefully you got to see those antique quilts from the James Collection. And again, if you did not, you can always find that archived video elsewhere. Coming up in August, Carol and Ducey will be back talking about the third exhibition in the series from the studio. So she'll be taking a look at all of the studio quilts that are on view, as well as giving some important context to um, how the James family, how artists and Robert James collected studio quilts, how they got to know studio artists, um, how they sort of cultivated relationships with so many of the important early studio quilters and then built a collection. And then of course, today I am talking about New Horizons, which sort of falls into my wheelhouse. It's looking at the quilts that we have collected since 1997 uh, that are from all over the world. So that is going to be my focus today. And as you can see there at the bottom, those are the dates for all three of those exhibitions. They'll be up all summer into the fall. Um, and we would love to have you come to Nebraska. We would love to host you in our beautiful galleries and you will get a real, a real eyeful <laughs> if you come this summer because we also have the Joanna Rose red and white quilts on view. So, please, we would welcome you uh, to take a road trip and um, spend a day with us or two, <laughs> a whole weekend maybe. I just wanted to give a very brief overview of our history since it is our 25th anniversary. It did begin with these things. Um, they began collecting quilts in uh, the very late 1970s uh, and really sort of built up ahead of steam in terms of collecting in the 1980s and into the 90s. You can see here, um, they're standing outside of their uh, dedicated storage facility at their home. Some amazing quilts on view there in their uh, storage area. Uh, My Crazy Dream is there on the far back wall. And uh, they had, you know, they had built a collection of, of nearly a thousand quilts of all, all, all types, all varieties, all ages. And it um, became clear to them in the, in the 90s that they would like to find a new home for the, the collection, a, a place that could take care of the quilts that could study them that could uh, research and work with scholars and also exhibit them. Um, that was very important to them that they be viewed. And in 1997, the quilts did uh, come out to Nebraska, to, um, to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Artis and Robert are both native Nebraskans. That was one reason they uh, were drawn to the University of Nebraska, but they also knew that there was just a really strong grassroots history of quilt making in Nebraska. And also they were familiar with uh, the work of Dr. Patricia Cruz, who is pictured here with them, who had um, helped the Nebraska Quilt Project uh, organizers produce uh, the book that came out of their documentation project and it won a uh, Smithsonian Renwick Prize. And so they were, they were familiar with her work as, as a researcher and scholar. And so um, the quilts came out in 1997 and fast forward a decade or so later, we were fortunate enough to be able to build a museum facility. Again, the James has helped us with that, the Robert and Artist James Foundation, but it was also thanks to so many donors, so many private donors from all over the world um, contributed to creating this fabulous home for the Artist and Robert James collection of around a thousand quilts, but for so much more than that, because we truly have grown uh, a great deal since then. 
Now, our, our mission as a museum is to build a global collection and audience that celebrate the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. And we do that in many different ways, but four of the primary ways are through our exhibitions, as well as other forms of education and outreach, through our collections care, uh, research, acquisitions, um, and in many ways, the New Horizons exhibition that I will be talking about um, in a few minutes is really about that acquisitions journey, how we have grown in so many important global ways since those early days of the quilts coming to Nebraska. But uh, just to very briefly show you uh, the, the results of some of that work, here are some of the exhibitions we have produced. We have uh, fantastic galleries that allow us to be able to do things like stack quilts, like you can see there on the, the bottom left uh, in our uh, abstract design in American Quilts at 50 exhibition. Um, and we can lay them flat if conservation reasons dictate. Um, we're always looking for new ways to display the quilts and to interpret them for our, our audience members. We obviously need to take care of the collection and our collections facilities uh, are, are outstanding. We have all of the temperature humidity control requirements covered. Uh, we uh, often take part in documentation efforts. Uh, scholars come in from outside uh, or we do them on our own. You can see on the bottom left, that's our photo studio uh, where we're able to take photographs, high resolution photographs of all of the quilts in our collection. Those do go on our online database. And so if you're ever looking for a certain style, pattern, era, geographical, geographical location for a quilt, our online database is a really great place to start. So um, these are all things that we do sort of behind the scenes. And it takes a lot of work to take care of a collection. We have a really fantastic collections care team. Research is always ongoing. Uh, we love working with outside scholars uh, who come in uh, maybe with a specific research topic in mind and want to dive into our collection for whatever reason, um, looking at whatever topic might sort of fit their research <clears throat> interests. And that can include, yeah, more documentation, <clears throat> working with students, Sometimes um, being on a university campus is wonderful because we're able to collaborate with professors, uh, both under, you know, and students who are both undergraduate and graduate. Um, they come to us with varied backgrounds and sometimes come to us with topics that we would not have considered. So research is still very much a part of what we do. And some of the results of our research come out in books like these. This is a sampling of some of the <clears throat> catalogs we have produced over the years. Our latest publication is for the exhibition series uh, that we're talking about today, An Evolving Vision, the James Collection 1997 to 2022. It is available on our website, our, our online store. Uh, it's a beautiful hardcover publication, 282 pages, over 1100 color images. You can see all of the exhibition quilts in there. Plus it's the first time that the entire artist and Robert James collection has been um, photographed and printed in its entirety. So over a thousand quilts in sort of a gallery style at the back of the book. So I would encourage you if you're interested in see, seeing all of those beautiful, beautiful quilts um, to go ahead and, and um, order that catalog on our website. So I'm coming to my main topic, which again is New Horizons, one of our three exhibitions um, celebrating our 25th anniversary. And as I said, this, this exhibition really is all about what happened after 1997. So up until 1997, um, the Jameses were doing this wonderful work of building primarily an American collection. And uh, the majority of the pieces were antique American, but they always had an interest in um, 
really being as um, in representing as wide uh, a, a part of the world as possible. They knew that there were quilts everywhere, pretty much <laughs> in every country, every region of the world at any rate. And that was something that they definitely encouraged us to do after the museum was founded in 1997. It, their, their collection, the James collection, was international when it arrived at the University of Nebraska. Um, in addition to the six countries represented by artists in the contemporary quilt collection, because they did have an outstanding collection of studio or contemporary quilts, um, and those artists uh, came from Canada, England, France, Germany, Japan, and the US. But in addition to those in the antique section, uh, there were nine countries represented, including Canada, China, England, France, India, Ireland, Japan, the United States, and Wales. But looking back, uh, Robert James summarized his and artists' intentions by saying that, quote, we had the brilliant idea of doing the impossible thing, which is to have an absolutely comprehensive collection of quilts from all over the world. <laughs> now that sounds like a tall order and it certainly is. And um, it's, it's uh, an order that we inherited uh, from the Jameses. And I think from day one, we took it very seriously, uh, this idea that we wanted to represent the whole world of patchwork applique quilt making. So over the years, we added examples of all of these different techniques and styles from countries all over the world. And today, our collection numbers nearly 1,800, our international collection nearly at numbers nearly 1,800 objects and includes pieces from over 60 countries, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. So you can see our growth here from 1997 to 2022, sort of a every five year snapshot of where we were at at the time. It's really fun to see this, um, this growth, uh, sort of things came in waves. We, um, in 2012, you can see there, it was a, uh, by that point we had added many, many different quilts um, over that five year period, but we have continued to do the same um, in the last 10 years as well. And we continue and we we intend to keep growing the collection. And here is a look at the various global components of our collection in terms of the overall numbers of pieces. So you can see that South and Central Asia are very well represented, as are parts of East Asia and Western Europe. Now, Africa and South America are continents that we are currently focused on for expanding our collection. We definitely need to um, work hard to grow those areas. And it's something that we are, of course, excited about. And we have lots of partners around the world, um, researchers, collectors, dealers, folks who know about uh, many, many different countries, many different ethnic groups, many, many different cultures and what their practices might be when it comes to patchwork quilting applique. So this is, as I say, an ongoing process, one that we are always excited to be engaged in. And I am particularly proud of the fact that over the last 25 years, we have produced over 25 different exhibitions with an international theme. Um, I, I think we have always wanted to live up to our name, um, the, the International Quilt Museum. Um, it, was, it was deliberately named international from day one. Um, and in fact, the Jameses were pretty adamant that the study center, as it was known then, be called the International Quilt Study Center because they really felt so strongly about the fact that this institution needed to be as representative as possible. Um, and so in, from day one, that is exactly what we wanted to do. We have had exhibitions like Collecting and Recollecting, which focused on quilts from Gujarat, India, or well, from all over um, Western India. So Gujarat, Maharashtra, as well as uh, Karnataka. We featured Eiko Okano and her delectable world. She's a Japanese quilt maker who features food 
in her quilts very often. Uh, we had an exhibition all about the quilts from Southwest China, quilts and quilt covers and garments, as you can see there, as well as an exhibition about uh, quilts and patchwork from Central Asia called Sacred Scraps. From Kente to Cuba looked at stitched textiles from Western and Central Africa and glasnost and folk culture uh, presented quilts made in Russia uh, right around the turn of the 21st century. So in the late 1990s and early 2000s. You can tell just a huge range um, styles eras, that is exactly what we have aimed to do um, all along, is show that depth and breadth of our global collection. Haley earlier mentioned that I am the, the project curator for our World Quilts website. Uh, I would love you to check it out, worldquilts.quiltstudy.org. We have these five modules currently available, the 1971 story, which is all about uh, abstract design in American quilts, the exhibition that was at the Whitney um, Museum in 1971, and sort of what has happened since then. Uh, our anchor site is the American Story. Uh, it takes a deep dive into American quilt history. You can find so much good information, well-researched documentation, links to so many other sites. It's, it's a really great place to start learning about American quilt history. We've got the Amish story, a Central Asian story, and the crazy quilt story. Um, we're always looking to, and our goal is always, um, whether it's on a web, our website or through other um, means of educational outreach, we want to contextualize the quilts and give our visitors a glimpse into the lives of the makers, because we know that's really what is um, so compelling and important to people. And I'm excited that we are also working currently on two new modules, as well as several others that are sort of in various stages of development, the Japanese story and the Raleigh quilt story. So to showcase this global coverage that we have in our collection, our current exhibition celebrating the James collection and evolving vision new horizons features 21 objects from 17 different countries. So that's from a felt applique wall hanging by a Canadian Inuit artist to a Tuvaivai bed cover made in the Cook Islands of the South Pacific. So you can see this on this map, we really are trying to get as much coverage, global coverage as we possibly can. Uh, as I said, that's an Inuit piece um, from a Northern Canada. But then we also have, uh, moving our way across the globe, we've got a robe from Syria, that lovely sort of pinky coral uh, robe. We've got a kilim rug turned into a quilt um, in the center there from uh, Iran. We've got some Central Asian and South Asian patchwork, um, Akanta. We've got a beautiful Southwest Chinese piece. So we really are trying to yeah, give you the, the whole, a glimpse of the whole quilt world in this exhibition. And when I was thinking about how I wanted to talk to you all today about the exhibition, I was thinking about how, you know, how can we make, how are these textiles that are from all over the world, how can we make them relevant sort of closer to home in our sort of day-to-day -day lives? And for, for those of us in the US who are not maybe directly interested in or involved in sort of ethnographic textiles from around the world, how can they become relevant to us um, maybe in our, our artwork or in just our daily interests? Um, and so I was thinking about the fact that there are familiar patterns, you know, sort of universal design ideas um, that people have used have taken in making their quilts. So for instance, I have an example here on the bottom of a, an antique wagon wheel quilt from our Byron and Sarah Rhodes Dillo collection, early 20th century, um, really great colors. I think it might, it's probably either Amish or Mennonite. It's just a fantastic piece. And then on Instagram, I found um, that to make a makes 
um, there, this person was creating a whole new version of wagon wheel. So there are these designs, these familiar patterns, these sort of universal um, design ideas that people have been drawn to. I think they can be, that, that can make things relevant for people today is to look at how, they, how um, people around the world have taken some of those motifs and ideas. Uh, I was also thinking about the current fashion for quilted and patchwork clothing. Um, quilted and patchwork clothing has often gone in and out of fashion. People have latched onto it at others at one time, and then a few years later, they'll say that it's just so old-fashioned or so, um, you know, sort of futzy or grandma-looking. But today, quilts are are getting the spotlight again uh, on the catwalk. And so I was thinking it would be it it can make um, it can put that current fashion into context by looking at patchwork and quilted clothing from around the world. And then I was talking about storytelling. And there are so many pieces in the New Horizons exhibition that are about telling stories about a specific culture. And a lot of those use figurative applique to do it. And so I was looking at, um, so Anna Marie Horner, she has a website and she has a whole subscription where you can join her applique story club and you receive a subscription of fabric and templates and ideas for how to make your own story quilts. And so this is still a relevant thing today. Wouldn't it be great to see how other people have done that around the world? So starting with uh, familiar patterns and also looking at patterns that are inspired by familiar objects or everyday things. I wanted to start with this from Uzbekistan, um, just a gorgeous piece. In the detail there, you can see, again, a kind of a wagon wheel uh, shape there. And I love those cheddar fabrics, what we would call cheddar, that sort of pop out. Uh, but another fabric in there that is so um, indicative of uh, Central Asian textiles but particularly Uzbekistan is that ikat fabric. So those, uh, that fabric where the warp threads are dyed, pre-dyed in a very specific pattern and then woven with dyed weft threads to, to create these patterns um, that are so distinctive and, and just so beautiful. Uh, and this Uzbek piece really uh, showcases the uh, ikat weaver's art form uh, and really instead of having those pieces cut up into tiny little patchwork um, I love how those wagon wheels are the large expanses of ikat that really highlights how beautiful that fabric is um, but in Central Asia pieces like this are used in many many different ways and a lot of times they're used as decoration. So like a hanging, you can see there are little tabs up at the top of this piece, just a hanging uh, or, or uh, just decoration in a home. But of course, because traditionally many Central Asian people lived in portable homes, yurts, um, it was necessary for your decoration to be portable as well. Um, and then sometimes if there was an honored guest who was coming to your yurt, you might place one of these patchwork pieces down on the, the ground for them to sit. If it was quilted, it could be a mattress. Um, but another role that patchwork in particular plays in Central Asia is as sort of spiritual protection. So those little triangles that are being repeated in that wagon wheel um, called tumar, and they are sort of amulets. They're, they are meant to Sort of ward off evil spirits, keep them away, keep them out of the out of the home, away from um, maybe vulnerable members of the family. So patchwork has many many different roles to play in this part of the world, um, and the, these are some really great antique images uh, of Uzbek women and families. On the left, you have an image of a Soviet era craft workshop. So these women, yeah, during Soviet times, um, they were making these crafts per, perhaps for, for sale. Um, and it's interesting, the history of these, uh, of workshops like this, not just in, in the Soviet Union, but all over the world. The, the idea that 
these traditional handicrafts can be saved or have been saved through these many different means, uh, including having organized government or non-government workshops. Um, I, that history is, is very important and vital in some areas for the, for the survival of some of these textile practices. On the right-hand side, you see this great photo of a family sitting in their yurt, showing off all of their worldly possessions. So these stacks of quilts uh, are so, they would be so important. And, th and they're stacks of quilts, but there's also um, pillows in there as well, but they all feature patchwork. And um, that was all just part of the, the um, really embedded in Central Asian Uzbek life. Um, but they are showing off their quilts, but also you can see they have, I think a phonograph and a few different um, record LP records down there as well. Now into Central, or excuse me, into South Asia, we have this piece from Pakistan um, made by a woman named Halima. And it was collected by Patricia Stoddard, who is a, uh, she's a quilt, a scholar of Pakistan quilts, of Indian quilts. And she collected this in the, in the 1990s from Halima. And what I love about this piece, um, again, I, I mentioned earlier that patterns um, are often inspired by everyday objects. This woman called the pattern Biso Bulo or nose jewel and nose ring. So um, that block that you see that has a red, a small red square, uh, that little red square is nose jewel for a woman who has a pierced nose. Um, and it's that nose jewel is then surrounded by the black nose ring. So I love that she made her own pattern based on an everyday object, one that is really integral to probably to her life and the life of so many other women. Um, having a pierced nose in South Asia often gives you status or indicates that you are married. Um, so it's very meaningful. Um, and I love that she took a part of her intimate everyday life and sort of transformed it into her own new quilt pattern. It makes me think of pattern, quilt patterns in the US like, you know, log cabin, Dresden plate, carpenter's square, pickle dish, that's a really good one. Cake stand, I love that these sort of, yeah, just everyday objects, particularly in women's lives have been like, yeah, have been transformed into these beautiful textiles. Um, it happens all over the world. It's not just the log cabin. It's not just the carpenter square. It's it's a phenomenon that happens all over. Um, and just like in Central Asia, patchwork and quilts are used in many, many different ways in South Asia. Um, they might be blankets or mattresses, floor mats, cradles, door coverings. Um, and in fact, on the left here, you see that it, a quilt is being used as a mattress on a charpoy. So a charpoy is a stringed cot that many people sleep on in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, and then on the right-hand side, a very interesting way of using quilts, they are being, um, they form the walls of a tent or a village meeting. And speaking of, you know, patterns that are familiar on the very far right-hand side there, it looks like we might have a log cabin variation or something quite like it there. So um, again, I love these ideas of quilts being made around the world um, in using similar patterns or uh, being inspired by everyday objects and um, just making something beautiful out of everyday life. Now here's a very special object. Um, this is a prayer rug from Persia, now Iran, early 19th century. Uh, the workmanship is absolutely gorgeous on this. Uh, it's covered in just really beautiful embroidery. There's metal wrapped embroidery thread, um, but really noticeable is the back stitching. It's called flat or false quilting, and it's a it's a hand performed or a hand sewn back stitch. Um, and for many people who are not familiar with these antique textiles or with the uh, with that 
false or flat quilting, it can almost look like machine quilting because it's so finely done. And the stitches, of course, have no gap between them. So this is just a, a fantastic, uh, outstanding piece. Um, but its its purpose is also just very, very special. Um, of course, in Islam, there, there are the five pillars of Islam. Um, and they are that, you know, Allah or God is, is the one true God. Um, and Muhammad is his, um, um, the one who, who revealed God and uh, paying alms to the poor is another one of the um, pillars of Islam, observing uh, your fast during Ramadan, uh, going on a pilgrimage to Mecca, the Hajj, if you're able. Um, but also one of the pillars is praying five times a day. So um, finding the appropriate place to make your prayers it can, it can be difficult, but a prayer rug really helps with that. It sort of acts like a portable mosque. You, you can point your prayer rug uh, in the direction of the holy city of Mecca, and it sort of acts like your own, yeah, your portable uh, place of worship. So that's uh, what this rug would have done for its owner and for its maker. Um, but again, it's sort of imitating an, an everyday place. It's a special sacred place, but it's something that's part of people's everyday lives. The shape of that prayer rug or of the embroidered portion of the prayer rug is meant to resemble uh, the mirab or the sacred niche in a mosque that faces Mecca. So um, I just love that a textile, a quilt, can be made um, into this, in, into sort of a, a sacred space, and can function um, as as almost uh, its own sort of portable uh, worship place of worship. Moving to my next category of quilted and patchwork clothing, again, it's the this is a topic that's hot right now in the quilt world. Um, there's been debate about whether or not antique quilts should be sort of repurposed or recycled into fashionable clothing. Uh, lots of opinions on both sides about that, opinions in the middle, a whole range of opinions about it. Uh, but it's not new to make clothing that features quilting and patchwork and our New Horizons exhibition has several examples, including this quilted, fantastic quilted waistcoat. It was uh, made in Northern China, um, probably by a Manchu um, artisan. The Manchus were the Northeast Asian ethnic group that ruled during the final Chinese dynasty, the Qing dynasty. Uh, which ruled uh, between 1644 and 1912. And um, the, so the, this was a Manchu style vest and the, it's a little bit difficult to see on that. It's such a beautiful black silk. Um, it's such a deep, dark, rich black. Uh, it can sort of make seeing the quilting patterns a little hard, but there are these roundels that appear on the, the front in three different locations, sort of on top of a, a sort of zigzaggy or meander pattern that's very common in Chinese textiles. And those roundels are uh, essentially a stylization of the show character or show symbol, which means longevity. And I included four, uh, like four stylizations of that character. It can there, it's almost endless how many different ways that character has been stylized. You see this really everywhere. Even if you just go to your local Chinese restaurant, you're probably going to see the show symbol there somewhere. Longevity is um, it's just one of the signs and symbols that is so uh, integral to Chinese symbology. Um, and so th that's one of the things that makes this vest very special, but also Again, that deep black silk fabric make it gorgeous, as do the gold buttons that adorn it all along the top and the sides. Now, I said that it was a common Manchu garment and made in the late uh, 19th century. And here is a historical photograph of Huyi himself. That's him as a young boy on the right 
He's with his father and his young brother. And you can see his father is wearing that exact same style of vest. It's a little hard to see in this photograph it's, if it's a quilted uh, version, but being in, the, in Northern China, the winters are extremely, in a continental climate, the, the winters are very, very cold. So I would not be surprised if his vests there were also, were also added and quilted. Um, but this quilt also has another connection to Puyi and the last emperor. It actually came to us with the provenance of having been collected um, in the mid to late 1980s by the assistant costume director for the 1987 film, Oscar award-winning film by Bernardo Berlucci, The Last Emperor. Um, so we think that it was collected as inspiration for the costuming on that film, which if you've ever seen it, is just absolutely sumptuous. It's gorgeous. Um, the costuming is just out of sight. So I love that this waistcoat in our collection sort of has a little bit of Hollywood fame to it. <laughs> um, our next garment is not quilted, but it's patchwork and it's from Japan, mid 19th century. It's made out of all of these tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces of men. Um, fabric and Chudiman is a crepe weave fabric. So it has sort of a, a little bit of a nubbly surface to it. Um, it was, the fabrics themselves are probably from the late 18th century, but the vest was then later, it was late, later, they were later constructed into a vest, probably in the mid 19th century. And we think it was likely from the Kansai region, which is where Kyoto is located. And Kyoto was, of course, Japan's uh, governmental and cultural capital for more than a thousand years from 794 to 1868. Um, so that's really, Kyoto was, is really still considered sort of the center of um, Japan's ancient um, long lived culture. And um, I think a lot of people, we, you know, we, um, we think of Tokyo, but Tokyo has really only been the um, governmental capital for, you know, a hundred plus years. So Kyoto really is, um, yeah, it's a special, special place. And these kinds of garments are likely rooted or closely associated with Buddhism, which of course spread from India into Southeast and then East Asia. So sewing scraps of fabric or small bits of fabric together are meant to symbolize uh, the Buddhist ideal of living a simple and frugal life. So this here is a seven panel kesa or um, a, a Buddhist priest's robe. Um, and the kesa is based on the earlier uh, jiasha from China, which is based on the original kasaya robe from India. Um, and it, this robe is said to replicate the humble patched robe of the Buddha himself. Um, so those roots are very, very strong, the roots of, of making patchwork, of reusing fabric. Um, and we here in the West are maybe more familiar with something like Boro patchwork that you can see there on the left. Um, very humble, um, usually worker or farmer clothing that has been patched and patched and patched and repatched. Uh, but the, it, patchwork comes in many other forms as well. And it's really, um, lately become associated with uh, the concept of motainai, um, and that is uh, really the very intrinsically Japanese notion of, of avoiding waste, um, uh, working towards zero waste. And that's just, that is partly comes out of the idea of kami, which is the, the idea that all objects, not just living things, but all objects in the world have a spirit um, and you need to respect that spirit and wastefulness um, does not respect the spirit of all objects. So it's very intrinsic to um, Japanese culture to reuse fabrics. And so I think that's another reason, in addition to the, the Buddhist sort of roots um, that reusing and uh, clothing, uh, reusing fabric in and making it into something like clothing is so um, important in Japan. Here's a very different sort of world. 
This is a uh, seminal patchwork skirt made by a seminal or Mikasuki uh, woman from likely from Florida or from far southeast United States. Uh, that tiny, tiny little patchwork that is so associated with Seminole, the Seminole people. And this is a skirt probably from uh, the 1980s or 90s. And um, the Seminole and Mikasuki people have been making this patchwork for at least 100 years, since, at least since the early 20th century. Um, you can see the, uh, a historical photo on the top left of some women wearing garments that um, a few of which a tiny little patchwork that we've come that has become so associated with the Seminole people. Um, and on the bottom left, um, from the mid 20th century, you can see um, one of the ways in which this type of patchwork became so popularized uh, throughout the United States, and that was through tourist textiles. So people in the uh, Seminole tribe would often make garments or other textiles to sell to tourists in Florida uh, when tourism really started to pick up mid 20th century when, when, when Americans were starting to have automobiles and were start, starting to drive all over to see their country. So, um, but another thing to remember is that it is a living tradition. Um, Seminole women still make uh, this patchwork and here is a photograph of uh, the 2015-16 Little Miss Florida Seminole, and she is also wearing a patchwork dress. So it's important, again, yeah, um, to remember that these are living traditions for many people, um, and hopefully we want it to stay that way. There are lots of Seminole and Mikasuki women uh, and artisans who uh, make, um, make patchwork and are on Instagram. So that's one place where you could go and learn more about native patchwork from the Southeast part of the, the country. That last category I wanted to talk a little bit about is storytelling. And I wanted to show you this Asafo flag. The Fante people um, from West Africa traditionally were divided into 24 different states or kingdoms along an 80 mile stretch of the Atlantic coast. So that's lots of little little kingdoms. And sometimes um, each one of those kingdoms would have from two to four different uh, militia groups. And those militia groups were called Asafo. Sometimes there were conflicts between the Asafo in one kingdom. Sometimes there were conflicts between Asafo from different kingdoms. Sometimes they weren't in conflict, but they wanted to um, assert their identities as a different, as, as a distinct militia group. So they adopted the European tradition of creating flags and made their own banners. Uh, and often these banners were intended to intimidate their rivals. And you can see here a three headed dragon uh, with a beheaded uh, soldier. <laughs> I think the the dragon or griffin, I'm not sure what kind of mythological creature he is. He's uh, apparently beheaded the opponent there who has dropped his rifle. So these banners are uh, just, they're just amazing in their uh, intricacy and in their, their storytelling. Um, and it's, it is all about sort of group identity and um, intimidating your rivals. Um, and like all flags, these had to be double sided so that people could see your banner from all sides. And so this is a mirror image on each side. The maker had to make the mirror image motif and applique it down um, so that it could be the same on both sides. And uh, the Asafo or militia groups, they were military, but they were also sort of like ceremonial and community support groups, maybe providing mutual aid within a, a community or kingdom. And these 20th century photos um, show that the flags are still used in, in ceremonial uh, purposes, for ceremonial purposes. And the ones on the right, you can see uh, feature, some of them have the flag on them and some have the Union Jack. So. Generally speaking, the ones with the Ghanaian flag are thought to have been made post-independence, which was 1957, because Ghana was formerly known as the Gold Coast. Um, and those with the Union Jack 
are generally pre-independence. A different um, sort of storytelling, a little less intimidating or violent, <laughs> is this piece from Bolivia. Um, and I love how she illustrated all sorts of aspects of rural rural life, including you know cooking, fishing, weaving, playing ball. Um, and she also depicts Bolivia's terrain really well. Uh, it has incredibly varied terrain. There's rainforest in the east, um, and then mountains and high plains and deserts in the west. So um, the desert part probably explains the fact that there's appears to be a cactus there. Um, I also like that she has a very sort of folk art or naive perspective. The woman on the sort of dancing on the mountaintops, she's pretty giant, whereas the boy fishing in the lower right, he's really kind of teeny tiny. So uh, we're not totally sure what our perspective is here. Maybe we're up on a mountaintop too, kind of hard to tell, but it's just a really delightful depiction of some everyday um, activities like weaving uh, in Bolivia uh, and of sort of native flora, including, yeah, a, a cactus is possibly a Bolivian torch cactus, which has those, those big, beautiful white flowers. Uh, and also depicted are two llamas or alpacas. So these are two very closely related animals um, and they have been used by people in the Andean mountains and the high plains for thousands of years uh, as pack animals uh, for meat, for leather, for wool. And um, the llamas are actually the national animal of Bolivia. And the country is home to more than 3 million llamas and alpacas. So maybe uh, if some of you are experts on llamas and alpacas in the audience, you can help uh, determine which we have here. I looked up you know, I, I know that llamas are larger, alpacas are smaller, the alpaca sort of has that tuft on the front of his forehead, and the llamas have what they call the banana ears. I'm not exactly sure who we have on this, this piece. It's kind of hard to tell, but they might be, they look like they might be smaller. So I guess I'm leaning towards alpacas, but I'm not completely 100% sure about that. Um, the final quote I wanted to show you is this really wonderful piece by Elizabeth Savanhu of Zimbabwe. And um, unlike the Bolivian piece, this one is told in sort of a gridded format rather than an overall tableau of rural life. This one shows rural life in many, many little vignettes going across it from sort of top left um, to bottom right. And we actually have an entire story here. <laughs> I won't read all of these but there are 25 blocks and 25 activities uh, in uh, sort of rural Zimbabwe or, or Zimbabwean village life. The first one here, number seven is she is watering the garden. So it tells the story sort of a, of a man and woman. Next we have, uh, they are pounding grain, which I love, you can tell that they're really getting into the activity there. Next is, um, now she's being accompanied by her husband to the maternity clinic. So that's great. So really true daily life for this woman. Uh, and we have, she's brewing beer. Oh, all right. Then they are going to drink the beer. So of course, you're, if you brew the beer, then you're going to drink it. And then lastly, now it's bedtime. So I guess that all of that makes a certain amount of sense. <laughs> and again, I think it's just so wonderful to see uh, daily life, daily objects, just our everyday world all over the world being sort of fed into our world, fed into folk art, fed into uh, the way we express ourselves. And I would like to urge you, um, if you would like to see these pieces more in depth, you will not want to miss going to our virtual gallery on our website. It is so cool. It's, it's um, created using Matterport technology. And you could literally walk through our gallery, zoom in on the quilts, you can read the labels. Um, so I only shared, you know, a portion of the quilts from this exhibition with you. you you're actually there if you go and check out our virtual gallery. So it's easy to find on our website. 
we also, again, would love to have you come and see us in person. So here again are the dates for the exhibitions. Please come to Nebraska. And before I'm done, I wanna put in a quick plug for an activity we're doing right now, a fundraiser for Ukraine. Uh, we have sponsored a Sunflower mini quilt challenge and we have over 200 mini quilts, 16 inch by 16 inch, donated by people who uh, are willing to have us auction them off. And the auction is happening next week. And all of the funds that we will raise in that auction will be going to Ukraine via the Rotary um, Disaster Relief Fund. So please go to our website. Um, the auction site is down at the bottom, but it's not quite live yet. So don't go to that, but keep an eye on our, um, on our events page on, cal uh, on our website. If you just go to, go to visit and then to our events calendar, there will be a link at the end of this week um, to go check out all of those beautiful 200 sunflower quilts you are not going to want to miss this auction. You can go home with something really, really beautiful, and you'll be helping us raise money for Ukraine to help um, with the disaster relief. So thank you. And before we go to questions, we have a, just a couple minutes left for questions. I did want to thank our sponsors again. Uh, we have our platinum level sponsors here, our si silver level sponsors here. And finally, our bronze level sponsors. We could not do it without them. So we just wanted to say thank you to them again. And Haley, I see we have about four, three or four minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Was there I'm a question start, I could get to? I'm going to start with the first question that we have here. Um, in you know, curating this exhibition, but also just kinds of things that you've seen um, from some of our international pieces. What did the back of the quilt look like in some of these examples? Like what was used as the back or the batting? Um, they suggested maybe like felt or yak wool. Like, have you seen yeah. any of those kinds of things? Well, in places like Central and South Asia, it would certainly um, often be cotton because cotton has been grown in those places. Although in South Asia, batting is often uh, recycled fabric. So a lot of times uh, women's saris, you know, wrapped cotton garments, if they get worn out, they often end up as the filler for a quilt in, uh, in India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So I'd say I've never seen anything like yak wool or anything really exotic like that. I would say that recycled fabric often is um, a filler if cotton isn't available or, or sometimes um, she, sheep's wool, but anything more exotic than that, I have not seen myself. Yeah, and then one last question, I think um, I'll ask this one because we just saw it about the llamas and alpacas. Did you say that they use them for leather? That is what I, <laughs> learned in my very basic uh, llama and alpaca husbandry research. I think they get you there. They, they get used in their entirety. Wow. I think a, a lot of us in the textile world are familiar with alpaca wool being spun into yarn. It is incredibly soft. It is the most sort of soft fiber you'll come across. It's really difficult. At least I think it's very difficult. Um, when I was a knitter, I don't knit so much anymore, but when I used to knit, alpaca was <laughs> incredibly hard to knit because it would just slide against itself so much. But um, so I, yes, I think the, the animals are used, there's zero waste again, um, but definitely as pack animals and as fiber animals, that's kind of what we know them best as. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's really all that we we can truly get into. Um, right. One last thing that I'll say is that you can start seeing all of the quilts that are going to be up for auction on our social right. media pages. So you can get a glimpse of things that you can bid on and, and write down those catalog numbers for things that you're interested in for when the auction goes up uh, later next week. That's, yeah. that's it. That's great, Haley. I'm glad you remembered that. That's a, and social media in general is just a great way to stay in touch with us and, and know what we're up to. Yeah. All right. So thanks. Thanks, everybody, Thank for joining us for today's Textile Talk.